Okay, boys and girls, this is Miss Thompson. I will be reading chapter five of A Night Divided for you. Hope you are enjoying your break and keeping up with our reading. Our quote for chapter five, the Germans and I no longer speak the same language. Marlene Dietrich, German actress, 1960. Since both Mama and Fritz worked through the afternoons, it was sometimes my job after school to stop by the market for food. Most things were gone by then, but Mama said that made choosing easier. This was true. Often by the time I got there, the choice was between red cabbage or white cabbage, as if I cared which one went into my basket. Today I wandered the aisles hoping something more exciting would be available. I could afford it if there was. The government kept the prices of everything we might need very low. It's just that the shelves were always more empty than full, and what was on them looked or tasted as gray as everything else. The good food was called benders, because if you had something worth trading, the clerk would bend down under the counter to get it for you. But Mama didn't want us bargaining for food. Just take what is offered on the shelves and come home quickly, she always said. More than anything, I longed for a banana. We used to have them years ago, and for my 12th birthday last fall, Fritz had bought me one off the black market. I still remembered its taste. Finally, I got some chicken, a few potatoes, and of course cabbage. I also picked up a few cans of cola, proudly made in East German factories. Fritz thought it left a bitter aftertaste, and one day, said one day he'd smuggle in some real Western cola for us. After that, he said, you'll never want our cola again. If that's true, then don't get it, I had responded. It'll be one less thing that I can buy. Once in line, I stared at the people ahead of me, watching them watch nothing at all because it was safer that way. Mama described us as practical, durable people, which I think she meant as a compliment, though I never took it that way. Our strength came from the collective. Every school teacher I'd ever had said that it said that until it played in my head like a skipping record. Individuality was a weakness, a sickness of the West. So we all walked in step, eyes ahead, and with conversations at a minimum. We all smiled, but not much, and frowned, but rarely cried. Nobody could succeed here, but most people around me seemed to be okay with that. It meant they wouldn't fail either. I didn't want to be like them. And at the same time, I was beginning to forget how to be different, how to be my own self. It was the feeling of being swallowed up, and I hated it. That was all I thought about as I hurried home with my groceries. We lived on the fourth floor of a drive apartment building that looked more or less like all the other apartment buildings. That wasn't an accident. Beautiful things were signs of individuality. Wherever possible, Mama had tried to provide some beauty inside the apartment, but still, our furnishings were spare and simple. With little to look at inside, I went to my room and stared down to the small garden space below. I had buried the peel from Fritz's banana there, hoping it would sprout into a tree this spring. I knew it was impossible, but I still looked every day. And when the tree wasn't there, I always turned my attention to the wall. If I got the, rank, the angle just right, I could see into West Berlin. There's nothing but greed and selfishness on the other side, my school teacher often told us. If you try to look, it shows nothing but greed and selfishness in your own heart. Well, I was greedy and selfish then, because I could never help but to look. I couldn't see much, but it somehow seemed brighter across the wall, as if the sun gave more of its light to the west. Maybe the people there were more selfish. I thought, because we needed that sunlight far more than they did. Then some movement at the wall caught my attention, and when I saw what it was, I laughed. A rabbit had become trapped in, in the death strip. They often did. But it was always amusing to see the Grinzers come running to try chasing it away. They didn't like the prints the rabbits left behind in their perfectly smooth dirt. Over the past four years, what started as a simple barbed wire fence had evolved into an entire system designed to stop, capture, or kill anyone who tried to get through. In most places in East Germany, even before reaching the wall, there was an open border area that nobody would dare get close to unless they had a death wish. 
People who encountered the Grinzers there on patrol often disappeared, sometimes for days, sometimes forever. Behind it was the, bl was the backland wall, which I passed each day. It was a simple concrete wall that surrounded West Berlin, making that free half of the city an island within communist East Germany. What I knew of the area behind the backland wall came only from the glimpses I saw from my window, or occasionally from Anna's bedroom if she didn't catch me looking, and from what Fritz told me he had seen the wall he had seen while out on bricklaying jobs. Beyond the backland wall was another barbed wire fence that might have been electrified, which I figured was bad enough, but Fritz thought it was something else. He believed touching that wire sent a signal to the guards in the watchtowers. If it was true, that would be worse. Past that was what we called the Death Strip. The government hadn't given it that name, but they hadn't discouraged its use either. Soldiers and fierce dogs often patrolled it. Barriers and deep trenches were set, set up to stop any vehicles that tried to crash through. And the dirt was left smooth, so on the rare chance that someone did get that far, it would be easy to follow him. Soldiers were ordered to shoot on sight and shoot to kill. They never hid that fact. And they had done it before. Western television broadcast the pictures of the border guards carrying dead bodies out of the dead strip or pulling them from the water. I'd seen it myself, at least when we could watch the television signal here. Our government would then respond with ridiculous excuses, such as heart failure or a swimming day gone bad. Well, heart failure didn't cause bleeding wounds ripped through a person's gut and nobody ever swam the Spree River for fun. They had tried to escape and had failed. Reminders of our own fate should we try it too. There were some successes, no doubt, though we didn't hear about them as often. Those who escaped usually kept quiet about it. They didn't want their loved ones left behind in the East to be punished. Eventually, the rabbit hopped away, or perhaps someone I couldn't see chased it off. I never could figure out how the rabbits got inside in the first place. Since they didn't pass through solid concrete, they would have had to dig a tunnel underneath. Even the animals wanted to leave East Berlin, I supposed. I would have kept watching for the rabbit, but Mama called me in to supper. I came in and plunked down beside Fritz, but right away it was clear his mom was somewhere else. He picked at the food until Mama finally set down her spoon and said, You're quiet tonight. What's wrong? He shrugged. Just a hard day, that's all. No, that wasn't all. I knew it, even if she didn't. Since the wall had gone up, Fritz never told Mom anything that made her more worried or sad than she already was. So if he went as far as admitting it had been a hard day, that meant something awful had happened, or would soon. Fritz met my eyes and offered a grim smile, but he looked away when Mama turned to me and asked, What about your day, Gerda? You had a pioneer meeting? Yes, I reached for another slice of bread. They had an announcement. A few days ago, the first person ever to do a spacewalk was outside the spacecraft for over 12 minutes. He's Russian. They want us to be proud of that, though I don't see how it has anything to do with Germany. They want us to be proud because it means the East beat the West. Nothing more. Fritz's tone was more biting than usual. Something was definitely bothering him. I decided to leave it alone. After all, sometimes I didn't want to talk either. Where's the butter? He asked. I shrugged. Food shortages. Butter never lasted long on the shelves. Trying to distract us both, Mama asked, Did anything else happen today, Gerda? Immediately I thought of having seen Dominic. Ever since that moment, I had debated whether to tell them. Would Mama be happy that I had seen him, or sad because she had not? I didn't know the answer to those questions, but I was certain of one thing. If either Mama or Fritz had been the one to see Dominic, I would want them to tell me. I hesitated a moment. Then in only a whisper, I said, I saw Dom this morning. The room became as still as the grave, and I almost wondered if Mama thought that's where I said he was. Shouldn't she be asking how he looked, whether Papa was with him, and how I had felt in that moment? But with a stiff voice, she only asked, where? On my way to school, on one of the platforms in the west. I think he was waiting for me. 
He knew I would be there. Mama frowned, and the lines in her face deepened. We've talked about this before. You shouldn't be looking over the wall. If the Grinzers caught you... One had. I still got a pit in my stomach when I thought about Miller's rifle against my cheek. But I certainly couldn't tell her that. Instead, I faced her scolding with my own anger. We wouldn't have to worry about the Grinzers if you'd let us leave with Papa that night. It wasn't the first time we'd had this fight. We all want to be together again, Mama's voice was tired. But it's not possible, you know that. Yes, I did. Some days, all I thought about was ways to get my father back here or how we might get over to him and Dominic, but never once could I come up with an answer. The wall was larger, stronger, and far more deadly than anyone my age could challenge. I hated that wall and resented my mother every time she tried to make me accept it. Did you hear me? I almost shouted now, but that was better than tears. I saw Dom today, your son. Fritz tried to calm me. Goethe, you don't. But it was too late. I slammed my fork back on the table and ran to my room. My father would have understood why I waved at Dominic, but Mama didn't. Sometimes I thought she was just like everybody else here, blind to the fact that there was an entire world out there beyond the wall. Maybe Mama no longer cared about Papa and Dominic or had forgotten them entirely. I never would.